All right, guys, welcome to lecture eight, uh, Simon's algorithm and applications to cryptography. So this is the introduction to quantum computing course uh, for the summer 2020 offering at the University of Paderborn. Some quick announcements. Um, so let me do announcement two first. Um, assignment six is due this Friday, okay? Um, and uh, number one is, uh, announcement is that uh, this week there is a TQC 2020 taking place, which is um, one of the international quantum conferences that uh, happens every year. Right. Uh, it was supposed to be hosted in Riga, Latvia, but unfortunately, due to COVID, everything has been moved online. So um, Latvia has been kind enough, or I should say the University of Latvia has been kind enough to uh, work very hard to be able to offer the conference uh, fully online this year. So that means that all talks will be streamed, uh, including poster sessions. So if you're interested to see um, some of the latest research in the field, you know, you're always welcome to just Google TQC 2020. It will start uh, tomorrow on Tuesday. Um, and you do need to register, I think, to get the link to like the Zoom seminars and so forth. So you could actually um, attend the talks and ask questions. Although I'm not 100% sure, uh, don't quote me on that. Anyway, just Google TQC 2020. If interested, you'll find the details. Okay, cool. So that is the intro for this week's lecture. Let's talk about Simon's algorithm. Okay, so um, last week we talked about uh, the Deutsch's algorithm and the deutsch jose algorithm, which is also the same thing as the bernstein vazirani algorithm. And these were algorithms that um, gave us our first hint that, you know, certain things seem to be possible in the query model um, much faster quantumly than classically. Okay, so you need, uh, for example, one uh, query to solve a problem exactly in the deterministic setting, uh, in the quantum setting, versus in the classical setting, you would need uh, many more queries. Okay. Um, and of course, that was not entirely um, satisfactory last lecture because uh, if you were allowing yourself randomization classically, then you could also solve uh, the deutsch jose problem, for example, um, with a probability of error that uh, scaled, that you know went down exponentially with the number of trials you ran. Okay, so basically, for all intents and purposes, you can also solve the problem classically as well, as long as you're allowing random coin flips. Okay, nevertheless, it, it was a very nice uh, first step, right? And the second kind of major step in this progression is Simon's algorithm. Okay, and, and so that's kind of where um, the the first the, the quote atop of today's lecture comes in, which is by uh, our good friend uh, Vincent Van Gogh, and he said, "Great things are not done by impulse, but by a series of small things brought together." Okay, so two things I two points I want to make with this quote. Number one, uh, it is important to note that. Um, you know, you know, Vincent obviously was not a mathematician. He was a, a very famous artist, right? And so uh, a lot of the principles that work in one area of research or work, such as the art, um, also transfer over uh, to areas like science, right? And this is a, a great example of such a principle, right? That um, to do something great, often you, it's really a series of small steps that takes place um, to get to your end result, right? And um, Deutsch's algorithm was step one in some sense, then comes Simon's algorithm. And in fact, Simon's algorithm was one of the key stepping stones for Shor's factoring algorithm, okay, which was kind of the, the magnum opus, if you will, okay? Um, yes, I always like to say, you know, they, uh, people like to think that things like, let's say, music and um, and research, for example, ac academic research, let's say, uh, are, are different, but there's a sense in which they're not, right? I mean, when you when you write a song, let's say, that's the same thing as, as writing a research paper, as coming up with uh, some new product, if you will, right? And then when you go on tour uh, to, um, you know, perform your song and to sell records, well, then in the academia, you go to conferences, right? And you give talks. And, you know, these are very similar um, ideas. It's just that you're researching different things, right? Different areas, but a lot of the similar principles apply. Okay. And the other cool thing we'll do today is that, you know, Simon's problem, again, in and of itself, it appears rather artificial. But besides from being a, you know, a stepping stone for developing Shor's algorithm, it can also uh, be used to break certain crypto systems, okay? And so that's um, what we'll talk about at the end of today's lecture, okay? So let's start with just Simon's algorithm itself. Okay, so section one in the course notes. So here's section one, Simon's algorithm. Okay, and so the setup is roughly similar to the deutsch jose and bernstein vazirani algorithms in the sense that, uh, number one, okay, so we're, let me be clear again, we work in the, the query model. 
Okay, so again, the only thing I care about is the number of queries that need to be made to some black box. Okay, so in particular, um, we're given uh, an input function. We're given an, as input, we're given a function f. And there'll be one difference uh, from last week to this week. Well, okay, it won't really be a difference, I guess, for... Um, for the burnt well, was it? I think last week the output was anyway. But this week the output is n bits. Okay, let me just stress that now it's a function that goes from n bits to n bits. Okay. And again, the key point is that um, we're like I said, we're in the query model, so f isn't given explicitly. You don't actually know how it's evaluated. It's given um, via um, black box access, black box access um, to some oracle. Uf. Okay. So uh, remember what this meant is that um, all other unitary gates, meaning other than uh, you know the oracle, all those gates count as free. We don't count the cost of that because we're in the query model. Okay. So what is the promise in the problem? So there's a promise on f. Okay. So the promise is that there exists a string s, so like a, you might call it a mask, and you'll see why in a second. So this is an n-bit string such that f of x equals to f of y only if, or I should say if and only if, either one of two conditions holds. All right, so um, just move my cursor over here. So either um, x equals to y, obviously, so that's kind of the, the trivial condition, or x equals to y, x or s. Okay, and, and let me be clear, you know that this is an n-bit string, right? So when I say x or here, I'm, I'm really mean bitwise x or. Okay, so for each bit of y and s, you, you just take the bitwise x or. Okay. So this is uh, the promise on f, and what is the goal? The goal is to uh, compute the mask s. Okay, that's the goal. Okay, so so what is this uh, string s? This magic string s. Okay, so let's just do a quick exercise as a sanity check. Make sure uh, you're comfortable with the question. Okay, so let's do, uh, this is the first exercise in the notes. And this says that uh, consider f, which takes you from two bits to two bits, two bits to two bits, such that f of zero, zero is equal to zero, one. f of zero, one is equal to one, zero. f of one, zero is equal to zero, one. And f of one, one is equal to one, zero. And now the question is, you know, what is S? Okay, what is a secret mask S? And so basically we have to look for inputs that lead to the same output, right? So for example, here on uh, on the right side here, you know, I've got zero one and you'll see that, you know, here I've also got zero one, right? So these two go together. Okay, so here I see that the set, you know, zero zero comma uh, one zero of inputs, those get mapped under F to zero one, right? So, I mean, this immediately tells us what the mask is, right? Because remember that um, these two inputs give it us the, the same output, um, if and only if, you know, you could write the two inputs as, you know, I could write this input as, say, this one, plus the mask S, right? Um, and in this particular case, of course, you know, if one of the inputs is zero, then the mask is trivially the other string, right? Because zero plus one, zero, right? If I do zero, zero plus uh, one, zero, that equals to uh, one, zero, right? So... Sorry, let me erase this, right? So, so the mask therefore um, must just be this string here. This is just S. Okay, so if, if you're lucky enough to find um, zero, zero, the all zeros input, plus any other string that goes to uh, the same output, then immediately you know uh, what the, the string S is, right? You know it's, it's one, zero. The other example, of course, is uh, you also have uh, this guy and this guy goes to the same output, right? So zero, one. 
uh, one one these go to one zero so let's just do a sanity check that these things um, if I do zero one plus s right which we just said is zero one plus uh, one zero right here I'm defining s like this right what is that equal to that it's equal, equal to one one right and indeed one one is what I see over here right that's the other string that goes to the same output okay so what are we really seeing here is that um, I have a function right I have a function that is not one to one but it's two to one okay so that um, you know I think of the inputs here um, here I've got the inputs and the outputs right and then basically what you've got is um, you've got pairs of inputs that mapped to that collide on on an output right it's a two to one function and the point is that the function itself is not just two to one but has a very specific structure right uh, the two points that go to the same output point are always of the form x plus s and maybe i'll call this you know x prime x prime plus s right so there's a very nice structure here so generally we should think of f as a two to one okay now i write generally for a reason right why is it not always the case when is f not two to one well what happens with s being just the all zero string right that's possible right when i let's go back to the promise for a second right I, all i said was that there exists a string s which is some n bit string right uh, by the way this is a funny looking n let me fix that um, um this is the part where you erase my friend huh interesting okay doesn't want to get erased all right um so if you have an n bit string you know it's allowed to be all zeros and then if s is all zeros then you know both these conditions coincide right there's this is a, a trivial condition now right so only the only time then f of x equal to f of y will then be if x equals to y which is the definition of being one to one right that's what it means for a function to be one to one or uh, injective okay um in this case then f is uh, one to one okay or injective so that's the setup you should think of it as you know you have uh, a function basically um, that is two to one in general and you're trying to figure out you know the rule that tells you who gets paired together is this uh, magic secret mask s and your goal is to figure out what is that s again um, an artificial problem arguably if you just stare at it on the face of it right um, but again one of the nice things about it and you know we won't prove this in the lecture is that we'll see that you can solve this with a polynomial number of queries um, quantumly but classically to solve this even uh, with a randomized algorithm would require an exponential number of queries okay so that's the the really nice thing about simon's algorithm okay but again as always right before we try to be smart we should try to be um, naive right which is what is the the simplest approach you can try to, to solve this problem right classically of course all right okay so let's just assume for now that uh, the mask is not zero to the n, right? So in other words, um, f really is two to one. Okay. So if I can find, so here's the, the idea, right? You know, all we have to do in quotes, right? If I can find two inputs which lead to the same output, if I can find a collision, right? If I could somehow figure out, you know, some x and some, um, some other string that both map to the same thing then i claim i can figure out what s is okay why is that well let me first write that down so if can um, find um, x not equal to y right such that um, f of x equals to f of y can compute s okay so all i have to do is to find the so-called collision okay so why is this true um and this is just because you know why well we know uh, by the promise on simon's problem that y in this case would equal to x plus s 
Okay, and, and so what I can write is, I could write zero to the n is equal to, you know, x plus x, obviously. Um, mod two, that always goes to zero. And then um, I could rewrite um, x as y plus s. So then I would get um, x plus y uh, plus s, right? So because I could do this, right? And, but now if you stare at this, you know, this is saying that by associativity, it doesn't really matter where I put the brackets, right? I could do this instead. So this is saying that, um, you know, this term in the bracket uh, plus this term in the bracket mod two goes to zero, right? So, and by the properties of the bitwise XOR, you know, this basically implies for us that S has to equal to X plus Y, right? The only way this can happen is if um, all the bits here match all the bits here by definition. So once I can find an X and a Y that uh, form a collision, right? That both map to the same output uh, and X and Y are different. Then by taking the, the sum of X and Y, I can figure out what S is. Okay, so this is what I want to do. I'm tasked with finding a so-called collision. And now um, I'm gonna be super naive, right? Uh, so maybe this is uh, idea one, idea two. Why don't we randomly, classically, right, pick uh, strings, whoops, not strix. I don't even think that's an English word. Um, or I shouldn't say maybe strings, I should say, say inputs. Inputs X. Um, uh, uniformly at random, right? And compute f of x, right, until uh, we find a collision, right? Two inputs that are different, but yet give the same output. So this is the idea. Let's just be silly. Let's just keep randomly picking inputs and um, try and analyze, you know, how many times we have to repeat this classically. Um, and of course, every time I compute f of x, remember that's that counts as one query, right? That That's one query. Okay, so let me um, ask a question now, which will slightly make this a bit more formal, which is, what is the expected number on average, if you do this game, of uh, queries if uh, we wish to succeed, um, apparently I've forgotten how to spell, succeed uh, with probability at least um, say a half, you know, pick your favorite constant, doesn't matter. Okay, so if I play this game, you know, how many times do I have to repeat it on average to succeed with some constant probability? Okay. So the answer to this question, if you've never seen this before, is probably not what you expect. Okay, so let's think about um, an analogous question. Let me call it Q prime. Okay, which is think back to the last birthday, birthday party you attended, right? And now ask yourself, you know, there are 365 days in the year. What are the odds that two people at the party have um, the same birthday? Okay. So, I mean, let's be slightly more formal. So imagine that, you know, we draw attendees to the party at uniformly at random. Okay. So we pick people out of the population basically, and each of them is, you know, equally likely to have a birthday on any other day of, on any particular day of the year. So how many people kind of do we have to pick on average? How many people have to attend our party basically before uh, there's a collision? There are two people who have the exact same birthday. Okay, so let me write this down. Um, so if there are n attendees at a birthday party. Okay, if you don't like birthday parties, you could think of any other get together with people uh, that you want to talk about. Um, how many attendees at a birthday party? Um, so if there are any atten attendees, you know, how large uh, must n be? before um, the odds that um, two attendees have the same birthday is at least a half. Okay, so, um, you know, you should think about 
uh, attendees, of course, as being queries, right? That's the equivalence we're looking at here. So, you know, if you have, imagine you have n attendees or n queries, basically, you know, how many times do you have to um, query the function or how many uh, attendees do you have to have, basically, before you find two with the same birthday, right? Two with the same, basically, output, right? So the function here for the birthday question is basically, you know, the input is a person, the output is the birthday of the person, right? And you're trying to find uh, a pair of inputs that goes to the same output, okay? And so naively, you would think that, okay, you know, my birthday, say, is, you know, January 1st, pick a day, right? Um, and so the odds of any other person having that birthday is going to be, you know, one out of 365, right? There are 365 other days, right? Um, and it turns out that the answer is not, um, you know, the probability of finding somebody else, if I were to randomly sample, the probability that they have the same birthday, right, is not going to be uh, one over, well, I should be careful how I phrase this, right? Um, but the expected number of attendees I would need is not going to scale with uh, 1 over 365, okay? Because you have to think about all all pairs of participants, right? So it's not just you fix one participant and then you, you compare that to everybody else. No, it doesn't work that way, right? Um, you have to think about all possible pairings you could take, right? So it's not like you're just fixing one party. And so when you think about all possible queries, right, it's like saying and choose two, not and choose one, right? So, so think of it this way, right? If I fix one member of the party, and then I think about all the other end members of the parties, sorry, at the party, then, um, you know, the, the the number of pairs I'm choosing scales like n choose one, right? It's going to scale like n. But if I think about all pairs I could choose, that scales like n choose two. That's now quadratic. It's n squared. So you expect in, in some uh, naive sense that um, the number of trials you would need is actually not 365, but should scale like the square root of 365, right? Because um, you're thinking about all pairs now. Okay. And indeed, um, it turns out that um, by the so-called birthday paradox, you know, you could, that's the, the name of this paradox. You can go Google it if you like. So you need approximately um, n equals to uh, 23 um, participants in order to get a probability of half, um, at least, that two people share the same birthday. Okay, so 23 is about the square root of 365. Okay, so uh, more generally, okay, so obviously this was for the case of 365 days in the year, but we can generalize this. Um, if there are D days in the year, uh, a collision occurs with probability um, at least a half if um, the number of trials or the number of people at the party scales like, um, I guess I want to put a theta here, um, square root d. Okay. Okay, so what this means is that, you know, um, therefore, uh, you know, returning to question one, right? or returning to Q, not Q prime, right here I called this thing, up here I called it Q and this one Q prime. So returning to Q, right? Um, sorry, let's be clear. Right, so um, there are, since there are two to the N possible inputs, right? Um, I expect to make, um, we expect to need the square root of that, you know, uh, theta of, uh, square root of two to the n queries before uh, we find a collision. Okay, so it's just like saying there are two to the n days in the year, you know, we would need uh, quadratically, quadratically fewer, um, you know, participants at the party th uh, to uh, find a collision. Okay, and uh, of course, so this is of course better than you, you might've expected naively, right? Naively, you might've expected it should you need two to the n. You need to basically query all the inputs, right? Um, and you know this is not true. It turns out. Okay. Um, and of course, note that this is still exponentially large, right? Okay. Good. So. Um, you know, forget about quantum for a second. You know, the birthday paradox is something that's just very nice to keep in mind. Um, and remember, the trick here is that um, when you're thinking about the number of trials you have to do before you find, you know, a pair of outputs which match, um, 
you have a basically a quadratic advantage, right? Because um, you have to take, uh, if you do n trials, then you have to think about all the ways you could pair those n inputs. So n choose two ways uh, to get a match basically. Okay, and that scales like uh, n squared. Right, so here, by the way, I'm using this fact aside that's worth remembering that, you know, if you have n choose k, um, this roughly scales like n to the k uh, when k is a lot smaller, whoops, than n. Okay, so certainly when we think of k as a constant and as n as being very large, you know, that, that's quite accurate, okay? So if you want more accurate uh, bounds on the, the binomial coefficients, you can, of course, just Google it. Okay, so um, that's just a naive classical algorithm, right? Um, the first thing you should always try. And it stinks, right? It's exponential. Uh, the number of queries you need is exponential. And the claim now is, of course, that quantumly we'll be able to do this using a polynomial number of queries. And that is the content of Simon's algorithm. So 1.2 Simon's algorithm. Okay, so how do we solve this problem, right? So let me just remind you, you know, recall, you're given a function f as a black box, 0, 1 to the n, so it takes n bits to n bits, and you want to find, uh, basically you want to find, uh, well, okay, and we said that um, f of x equals to f of y, uh, if and only if we're promised that uh, either x equals to y or Sorry, there exists an S such that uh, X equal to Y plus S over here, right? And, and so our goal was we wanted to figure out what is this S, right? Given black box access to F, that was the goal. Okay, so there are two parts to the algorithm now, which is gonna be a departure from what we did previously. And, and the factoring algorithm is the same actually, right? So for, for example, for the Deutsch-Chose algorithm, we just ran this quantum circuit, we measured, and we got the answer with certainty, and we were done, right? The Simon's algorithm doesn't work that way, right? So there's gonna be a quantum component, you're gonna run it, but uh, when you run it, it's gonna allow you to basically sample some output string, and you're gonna to have to repeat that uh, a number of times, and then on top of that, you're still gonna to have to do classical post-processing to get the right answer out. Okay, so there's both like a quantum component and a classical component, if you will. And again, the factoring algorithm is very similar in its setup in, in that regard. But now, of course, when you, I'm going to write down the circuit um, just in its, its full glory for Simon's algorithm. And when you first look at it, it's going to look quite similar to the deutsch joseph circuit, actually. So let me first write down the circuit. And as I write it down, what I want you to do is uh, try and spot the differences between um, this circuit and what we saw last week for the deutsch joseph algorithm. Okay, so uh, here's the circuit. Uh, and let me denote this as Cn for, you know, f is an n-bit function here. And the circuit acts on two n qubits. Okay, so it's twice as big as the input. And so what does it do? It uh, does the following. So I'm going to have input bits, of course. Dot, 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 zero, uh, zero, zero. Okay. Then... We're going to have Hadamard gates. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, now of course we're going to query the oracle. So we have another set of Hadamard gates. And now we have measurements. So these are just standard basis measurements. Okay, and um, you should think of it as, you know, there are two registers here, right? Each of these are n qubits. Here's one, here's another one. And recall basically that um, when I apply uf to this pair of inputs, right? So let's say I, I do x and y, right, like this. So maybe um, over here on the first guys, I just plug it in X and over here, maybe I put Y. Remember what this does is it takes, it leaves X alone because we want this thing to be reversible and it XORs on the answer onto the second register. And again, this is N qubits now, right? So the, the plus is really um, bitwise XOR. Okay. 
So this is the circuit, the quantum portion of the, the algorithm, the circuit CN. So I'll stare at this for a second and ask yourself, you know, how is this similar to and how is it different from the Deutschosa circuit that we saw last week? Okay, well, so let's see. Um, so the Deutsch's algorithm also has this, you know, there's a, an oracle and you have a bunch of inputs, you know, the input strings here, you basically do Hadamard's, which meant that since we started in the all zero state, this brought us to a superposition of all possible inputs to the function, right? And then we did a set of Hadamard's afterwards to um, cause interference. But what was different uh, for Deutsch Schoza is, is, you know, this, this second register here, right? Um, so in particular, in the deutsch algorithm, we wanted to know if um, we had a function that mapped to a single bit, right? And we wanted to know if the function was constant or balanced, right? Do all the outputs go, go to the same, do all the inputs go to the same output bit, or do half of them go to zero and half of them go to one? So first we had just a single um, output wire here, not n of them, but there is a more, more important one, right? So let's say deutsch had um, one, uh, output wire, and by output I mean I'm referring to this register here. So that was the first difference, but there's a, a more important difference. In the deutsch jose algorithm, right, um, I also had a Hadamard here, right, uh, and I initialized this thing to not zero but a one, right, and so the reason why we did that is that, remember in the deutsch jose algorithm we used the phase kickback trick. The answer to the oracle was not encoded in the register but rather in the phase. Okay, um, phase kickback. Okay, um, and here we're not doing that, right? Because here, if you look at this, uh, here I have, uh, it's just zero and there's no Hadamard on this wire, right? Um, so first of all, it's zero instead of one, but second of all, there's no Hadamard, right? Alternatively, I, you know, in Deutsch shows that, you know, the wire looks like this, but you start with a minus sign. You can think of it that way, a minus state. Okay, we're not doing that here. So we're not using phase kickback in this algorithm. That's the other main difference that I want you to um, keep in mind. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna repeat this uh, a number of times. And what it's gonna do is, you know, we're gonna measure um, the output bits here, right? There are two end bits, basically. So we're gonna measure, and from that, we're gonna extract uh, a sequence of end bit strings yi. So here's um, kind of the uh, high level sketch. Okay, we will repeat CN basically order n times, not just once, each time obtaining some output string yi in uh, 0, 1 to the n. Okay, so you know, on the ith run of this thing, I'm going to get you know the ith string yi, and each of these is going to be an n bit string. Okay, and um, so in particular, what this means is that, you know, the, the quantum algorithm itself is, of course, not the entire algorithm. And really, there's a nice, more general view This is uh, that's worth kind of taking home with what's happening here, which is that you should think of quantum circuits as giving us the ability to sample according to distributions that we normally cannot do using just a classical randomized machine. Okay, so you should really think of a quantum circuit as just some big sampling box. Okay, so in particular, uh, in Simon's algorithm, or I, maybe I shouldn't say Simon's algorithm, but CN allows us to sample. Um, so I should say, you know, each run of, so every time I run CN, it'll allow me to sample, um, and this is uniformly at random, from a very particular set, from some set y, I'm defining it this way, so that's why you see the, the colons and the equal sign. It's a set of all strings, all n bit strings, which have inner product zero with s, again, mod two, okay? So I'm claiming, and of course, we'll, we'll prove that this, this holds, right? 
I'm claiming that every time I run the circuit and I measure, right, I'll be essentially the output will be a string that is from this set. Okay. And which string do I get from the set? Well, it, it's chosen uniformly at random. So running the circuit is allowing me to simulate uh, a uniform sampling over this subset of all strings. Okay. So basically, if you want to think about, you know, what does it take to solve Simon's problem? Basically, what you need is the ability to sample uniformly from this set. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you get that from a, a quantum algorithm or maybe there's some other model. Um, the point is that you just need to be able to sample from the set. And the second thing you'll need, which we'll get to shortly, is classical post-processing. Now, um, before we continue, remember our goal was to, we wanted to know, you know, what is us? That was our goal, right? And I'm telling you every time you run CN and you measure, it'll give us uh, uniformly at random one of these Ys that satisfies this zero in a product property. So why in the world would I want to repeat this a number of times, right? Because then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get, you know, if I repeat this a number of times, I get, you know, some string Y1 such that this is zero, some string Y2 such that this is zero and so forth, right? Why might this be useful? Like, how would this help me extract S? And maybe it'll, it'll help you to think about the fact that, you know, if you expand the inner product, what does it look like? It looks like, you know, S1 uh, times Y1, uh, one, right? So Y1 is the vector, but now I'm looking at the first component of that, plus S2, uh, Y1, comma, 2. So the second component, dot, dot, dot. And I'm saying that this inner product equals zero. So, you know, if you think about this long enough, you'll see that you're going to get a system of equations, right? So why might that be helpful in extracting s so you know we'll come to that answer of course but you know this is just to uh, get you to try and think ahead a little bit while i write down the next heading okay so this is the claim right that when i run the the matrix uh sorry the circuit cn i'm going to sample from the set right so let's trace through the execution of CN, as we always do. So I'm going to, you know, um, here's our time, our, let's say, uh, I want to call that my first time step. So this is time step one. This will be time step two, as far as I'm concerned. Um, then we'll, here we'll have time step three. And then here we'll have time step four. Okay. So what are um, time steps? Um, well, time step one is just the all zero state. So let me just write that down. Mm, you know what? Maybe if I could copy and paste this thing, I could even, let's see, let's try and copy and paste this um, so that we could reference it. And then I could say, aha, technology helped. Copy. Let's see how this is going to work. Um, paste. Woohoo! That worked quite nicely. All right. So we want to analyze this thing, right? And I have these time steps. So the first time step, psi one, is, is trivial, right? Basically, what I have is um, zero tensor n on the first kind of half of the state and zero tensor n on the second half. Okay, so, um, right, this is the first half, this is the second half. Okay, and then after I do um, the first set of Hadamards, right, remember what this took me to is um, technically the plus state tensor n, which remember from last class just means um, when you expand the plus state tensor n, it's just an equal uh, superposition over all inputs. So um, when I then do uh, the Oracle query uf, then we get psi 3. And what is that? Let me just expand this. Um, what I know is that, you know, my first register was plus tensor n, so that means that I have an equal superposition over all the possible inputs. So that's the first register. And now I ran the Oracle query, right? And the, my second register was all zero, so that means that it's just gonna write f of x here, okay? So again, I'm not using phase kickback here, right? I'm literally writing the answer uh, to the query. I'm writing it right here, right? It's not going into a phase. Okay, now, what I would like to do next, of course, 
Okay, so of course now here's your standard setup where you kind of have all uh, inputs coupled with all outputs, and now I want to um, do some sort of interference on uh, this state in order to learn something about f, right? Now, ideally, you know, I want to apply these last set of Hadamards, right, to figure out what a psi four will be, but I'm going to play a, a small technical trick just to simplify the analysis. Okay, so you'll notice here that you know we're measuring all two n uh, qubits here, right? And you know the Hadamards are just on the first n qubits, but the last uh, n qubits, there's nothing happening here, right? Um, and these Hadamards, of course, they don't they don't touch these qubits at all, right? So you know the measurement here, you should think about it in like this, right? So I have a this is a measurement basically in the Hadamard basis, if you will, uh, because first I do a Hadamard, then I measure in the standard basis. Um, and when I say, of course, a measurement in the Hadamard basis, I mean according to the eigenvectors of the Hadamard operator. Um, and here, this is a measurement in the standard basis. So these two kind of sets of measurements, they don't touch each other, right? They're on disjoint, disjoint sets of qubits. So they commute, right? Um, and so the order in which I apply the measurements, whether I measure this first or I measure this first, you know, it doesn't matter at all. Okay, like the, the resulting measurement statistics will be exactly the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in order to understand better what's going to happen here, I'm actually first going to measure these guys, right? Uh, and then condition on the outcome of that, then, you know, it'll be easier to see what's going to happen up here. And of course, by the way, you know, intuitively this idea that, you know, uh, the order whether I measure this block first or this block here, the order shouldn't matter, that intuitively makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you're in a lab, right, um, it's not realistic, it's not really going to be realistic to measure everything in one shot, right? You're going to do things sequentially, right? So uh, if the order mattered, right, then somehow things wouldn't be well defined anymore, right? At least intuitively it should feel that way. Okay, um, so here's now, um, uh, sorry, what I wanted to do is I wanted to write psi four and here's the idea. Let's play a technical trick. Uh, so measurements on, um, let me call this, um, let's say register R1 and R2, right? So the measurements on R1 and R2 uh, commute, right? They act on disjoint sets of qubits. There are no gates that cross across the wires. Uh, therefore, uh, the order um, of the measurements doesn't matter. Okay, we'll get the same measurement statistics in the end. Okay. Um, so now what we do, so, uh, so therefore, let us first measure R2, 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 D2, R2, right? Um, corny joke, I know. Um, okay, and then we get, we get some string Y, right? Okay, when I do this measurement, you know, uh, out here, I'm going to get some string Y will come out, okay? So what does this mean now, right? The first half of the state is still uh, in superposition, but now that I've seen Y on the second register, right? Then um, I know, so here, you know, this is the joint state, right? Now that I measure this and over here now I see um, Y basically as a string. What happens is that remember, you know, the superposition will generally collapse and what will it collapse to? It will collapse to all choices of X, which are consistent with Y on the second register, right? All X such that F of X equals to Y. Okay, so now what happens is we get a collapse of R1, right? So uh, in particular, um, R1 contains precisely those x, those inputs x, such that f of x equals to y, right? That's the measurement postulate telling us that measurements results have to be consistent, right? The superposition is updated uh, so that everything is consistent. Okay, but of course now we know um, that we have a promise, right? I know that assuming, let's assume the mask right now is not the all zero string. I know it precisely that for any Y, there are two pre-images X, right? So, but assuming S is not equal to the all zero string, um, Y has 
two pre-images x, right? They're precisely two strings x that go to y under f. Okay, let's put that here. Okay, and what are those? Um, well, you know, there's there's some string x, and there's um, some string x plus s, right? Okay, I realize this is not. Um, so okay, this is not exactly the best notation, but the point is that you know, um, the pre-image of y, you know, uh, pick the pick one of the two pre-images, right? Let's call that x. The other pre-image is always that thing plus s. That's what I'm trying to say here. Okay. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that this implies, this is a really nice trick, right? This implies that our uh, post-measurement state um, and let's, we're not at Psi4 yet, right? I haven't applied the last set of Hadamard, so let me call this Psi3 prime is the following, Psi3 prime is equal to 1 over root 2 x plus x plus s, right, and y. Uh, sorry, uh, okay, it's technically y, right? Um, but technically speaking, of course, this is um, f of x, right? Um, we're thinking of y as f of x here. So this means that um, when I measure just these wires, but not these ones, right? I haven't done the Hadamards yet. Then um, I collapse my entire giant superposition, this, uh, this bad boy over here, I collapse the whole thing down to just superposition over two guys, whoever is consistent with what measurement result I saw. Okay. Um, and so, you know, this is a key idea here. It's, it's this idea basically of post selection in some sense, um, loosely speaking, which is that, you know, when I measure one register that collapses another register onto um, some nicely structured superposition, right, that I, that I can say something about given the promise to the problem. Okay, so this means that now I know that now that I've done the measurement y, right, um, and I've gotten y. Well, now I know that um, this is my state, and now you know applying Hadamard's to um, this superposition of two terms is a lot easier than than this kind of big nasty mess over here, right? So let's do that. So now what I need to do is you know to get a psi four. Now I need to just apply Hadamard's to this first register here. So this is, you know, the register R1 and this is the register R2. Okay, so that, let me just put that at the top. Um, so now um, I need you to recall from last lecture, we're going to use a fact that we had. And the fact was that if I had any string X and N bit string and I do Hadamard tensor N, which is what we're going to do, right? Remember that this just gave us this superposition. So, you know, we had the, in the phase we had x dot y, so x is, you know, x is what I start with and y is what I'm summing over and then y. So this is just a fact from last lecture. And again, the inner product is uh, mod two. Okay, so what do we conclude? You know, take this thing over here and just kind of plug in this fact. Um, so psi four therefore is what? Well, I'm gonna have, um, so I'm, I'm doing Hadamard. So um, each Hadamard is gonna kick out a one over root two factor. So I'm just gonna put them all in the front. So I started with one copy of one over root two here, right? And I'm gonna get n more. So I'm gonna get one over root two, two to the n plus one. Okay. And now I'm gonna put big brackets. Um, the right side stays the same, right? It's still f of x, uh, just like before, right? So this hasn't changed at all. But the question is, you know, what happens to this thing, right? Under the Hadamards. And so I can write uh, the sum over all y in 0, 1 to the n of negative 1 to the x dot y, y, right? Plus uh, the sum over y is in uh, 0, 1 to the n of negative 1 to the, let me erase this a little bit, x dot uh, sorry, no, I don't want that. I want x plus s, x plus s dot y, and then y. Okay, so the only thing I did here is I just literally um, applied Hadamard's to this, and this just meant I plugged in this identity here, right? So in particular here, 
the string here is x plus s, and so uh, that comes into the exponent here, as you, as you see right here. Okay. And so let me just uh, move things around, right? Because here I have this the same choice of uh, y here and, and have minus one, so I can collect like terms, right? So you could rewrite this thing as one over uh, root two n plus one, the sum of over all y. So now I'll just have a single sum. And let me factor out this term. Okay, because um, you see here, it's here, that term is here, but it's also here, right? This is the same thing as, um, here I'm gonna use a fact, right? That um, x plus s dot y is actually equal to x dot y, um, x or um, s, s dot y. Okay, so let me plug in that fact, right? And so that means that I could factor out the x dot y part. And then inside here, I'll get a one plus minus one to the s dot y of y. Okay, and then uh, f of x just like before. Okay, so all I did is I just, uh, you know, factored like terms and I just, instead of two terms and the two sums, I have one sum now. Okay, so to really understand uh, where to go next with this, let's have a look now at this expression, right? The one we just factored out. So this is basically very close to canceling out, right? You have one plus a minus one. The only question is, um, you know, what is the exponent on the minus one? Okay, so the observation, of course, is that if s dot y is one mod two, of course, is addition mod two, it's an inner product mod two, then uh, you have one plus minus one here, and, and this goes to zero, and that means that uh, that term disappears, right? Okay, so the only terms in this sum which have a hope of sticking around, right, are gonna be the y for which this s dot y is equal to zero, right? Because then, you know, the minus one, the phase disappears. Okay, and remember s dot y does mod two, so the only possible answers you could have are one and, and zero, right? Um, so therefore, only um, terms with s dot y equals to zero matter. Okay, these are the only terms that will not disappear. Okay, so therefore, I could rewrite this entire expression um, as follows. And I'm gonna write it slightly differently, and this is because, um, so the normalization um, is more accurately gonna be this now. Uh, actually, I don't need the big bracket. Okay, so I've got uh, the sum over all. Okay, so now it's the sum over all y, which satisfy this inner product going to zero, right? Those are the only terms that'll stick around. Okay, and then I'm gonna have uh, minus one to the x dot y. Okay, um, and then times y, and then f of x. Okay, so in other words, um, after I measure and I post select on the register R two, basically, then in the measure in the register R one, um, conditioned on that, uh, this is what we get. Okay, and now. Um, so it's basically a superposition over all the all the possible y, which satisfy the, precisely this equation, right? So this is, um, you sort of see where we're going with this. Right now, if I measure this guy, I mean, the, the relative phase is not gonna matter at this point because um, we're just gonna measure this in the standard basis, right? So the phase is kind of gonna disappear now. Uh, then we're basically gonna be sampling um, a y, right? Um, so that s dot y holds, equals zero holds, sorry. Okay, so, um, and of course, note that every term here in the superposition, you know, up to this relative phase, which isn't gonna matter for a standard basis measurement, uh, they all have the same weighting out front. Okay, so they're, um, we're uniformly sampling from the set to capital Y. Okay, so uh, remember this is R1, this is R2. So measuring um, R1, therefore um, samples, sum y such that um, s dot y equals to zero uniformly at random, okay? And that's exactly the claim we had made earlier, right? We made this claim that um, 
what Simon's algorithm is going to do is that it's going to allow us to set a sample from this uh, set capital Y efficiently using a quantum circuit. Okay, and that's exactly what we've shown. Okay, and so, um, of course, in doing this uh, over here, the, the normalization change, you know, this is um, because, you know, we uh, when this is zero, then you get a factor of two coming out, basically. Um, but it's also good to, um, as a sanity check, you should check to make sure that everything's right. Uh, in principle, this is a uniform superposition over everything in the set capital Y. So one of the exercises, which we will not do here, but it's in the notes, is, you know, um, prove that indeed this normalization factor is corresponding to a uniform superposition over everything in Y, or uniform sample out of Y, sorry. Um, and in particular, prove that the, the size of that set Y, uh, maybe I should write it a bit more like the way I'd written it before, is indeed 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, so that's why um, when you have this normalization factor, it corresponds to, you know, picking a random element out of the set Y. Okay, but that I'll leave as next slides. Maybe we can do it in tutorial. Okay, so that's step one of the algorithm, right? I mean, you run this thing. Every time you run it, uh, uniformly at random, you get a Y such that S dot Y equals zero. Okay, now the question is, what in the world do you do with all these Ys, right? We just said, we don't just sit around collecting them, right? So what we do, this is now going to be the classical post-processing phase. And, you know, I really want to stress, for example, that you might think that the classical post-processing is kind of the, the less interesting or the less important part of the computation, but I really want to stress that this is completely, um, in general, not the case. Okay, there's something very special about the combination of a quantum sampling algorithm followed by classical post-processing. Okay, so indeed, for example, um, when we talk about the factoring algorithm in a few lectures, that also has um, you know, a quantum part that consists of doing a Fourier transform um, and uh, a classical post-processing part. And it turns out that if you all you want to do is that um, the first part of this um, circuit, just this quantum Fourier transform, on an initial state of all zeros, that you can simulate classically. Actually, you can simulate that classically. But what you cannot seem to do is simulate the output of that together with the classical post-processing, because the output of that uh, quantum Fourier transform is sufficiently complicated that you can't update that description uh, together with the post-processing that's supposed to happen classically. Okay, so I really want to stress that um, don't underestimate the role of the classical post-processing in these algorithms. Okay, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the circuit CN n minus 1 times. Um, and that gives us you know, y1 through yn minus 1. All of these strings are in the set uh, capital Y. Okay, so, so that means that um, IE yi dot s equals zero, okay? And so letting, for clarity, letting s of i denote the ith bit of some string s in zero, one to the n, we uh, have the following, right? So when I have n minus one of these uh, strings, um, I've basically got n minus one of these equations, right? So I can expand this out. So it's kind of clear in terms of individual variables, not just with vectors. So the first bit of S, so I'm trying to figure out S, right? I don't know S. Uh, maybe I should write the S's in uh, red because that's what I'm trying to figure out. S of one, S of one, um, S of two, S of two, uh, S of n, S of n, right? And then you go all the way down and you've got more of this. Um, S of one, S of two. Okay, and then the what I do know, of course, are I know the string y1 and each individual bit of it. So here's the first bit of it, here's the second bit of it, and so forth, so forth. Um, and then I have uh, the last bit of y1, which is yn. And I know this inner product is zero mod two. Um, likewise here, y2 of one plus uh, y2 of two plus dot 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 plus uh, y2 of n. Y, uh, and now here we have uh, y n minus one. So I picked n minus one strings. Y n minus one of n. Okay. 
Okay, so um, this is all uh, over, uh, you know, the the finite field F two, right? And so this has um, element zero one. Okay, so it's addition mod two. Let's be clear. Okay, so I have a system of equations, right, um, over this field, and this we could always solve using uh, Gaussian elimination. Okay, and that will take. Right, so this is the reason why do we want to collect these, right? I don't know what S is, but you'll notice how S is the same in each um, equation, right? Uh, it's just the Y's that are changing. So if you give me sufficiently many constraints, right, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a second, then I can try to use Gaussian elimination to basically solve the system of linear equations because that's what it is, right? Um, and uh, to figure out what all these variables S1, S2, up to SN are. Okay, and that in turn will tell me that hidden mass gas. Okay, so um, so what we do then is we run Gaussian elimination. Okay, so anytime you want to solve a linear system of equations, this is kind of like the uh, the old algorithm to do this, right? And this takes um, order n cubed arithmetic or a slash field operations. Okay, um, to to solve for s to uh, obtain s. Okay, and so let me just make a slight point of clarification here. Um, here I'm saying that it takes order n cubed time, right? Um, n is the length of the string s. And um, you know you have to be very careful about how you um, quantify cost, right? So for example, if we're talking about, uh, often when you're talking about mathematical problems, you wanna solve computationally. So for example, you have a system of linear equations, or you want to you know, simulate an integral, let's say, or a derivative, um, things like this. Um, there are two ways you can imagine um, solving the problem or um, quantifying the cost for solving the problem, right? The most natural way to do it is, is this right here, which is you, you count the number, count the number of field operations. So let's say you're working over the field, for example, F2, or maybe more generally, you're working over, say, the complex numbers, then what we're going to do is every time I do one of the field operations, meaning a, an addition or a multiplication over that field, then it costs me one unit of cost. Okay, so count the number of field ops. Example, uh, multiplication or uh, addition, etc. Okay, so that's in some sense the most natural um, metric, if you will, for measuring cost, especially when you're doing something like this, like solving systems of linear equations, because it gives you some um, kind of ballpark rough sense of uh, what is the number of operations, quote unquote, um, you'll need to solve the system. Okay. Now, of course, uh, we're computer scientists. And so what that means is that realistically, you know, to really have an accurate picture of cost, you have to take into account the underlying machine model, right? So here, uh, you know, I'm charging you one for a multiplication, but of course, this is not entirely accurate because uh, if you were to actually use the Turing machine model, which is uh, what we think of as kind of like the standard benchmark, right? then you know to actually implement the multiplication of two numbers right of two real numbers two n-bit numbers of course it does not cost one step on a turing machine or a constant number of steps right um, the cost of that multiplication will depend on the length of the input okay so this is and if you really take into account the cost of each um, bit operation okay on a turing machine then of course you'd get a, a bigger cost in order n cubed okay so it really depends on how and to what level of detail uh, you want to go into when you do this analysis. Typically, I think you you stick with the you know these field ops because it gives you a very good sense of the structure of the problem and what kind of operations it uh, requires. And then beyond that, you know, I mean, uh, things like arithmetic and uh, addition are kind of standard uh, subroutines you can manage and you call for some um, predetermined cost. Yeah. Okay. So the point of that discussion was just to to be clear that you know. Whenever a runtime is given, especially for these types of mathematical computation, uh, scientific computation type problems, um, do pay attention to what kind of uh, cost metric you're talking about. Are you counting the number of additions over the field, for example, or are you actually counting the number of low-level bit operations, including the cost of doing, for example, addition of two n-bit numbers, right? So, so for example, if I add x plus y, right, uh, where these are n-bits, right, uh, the, the cost of this, the bit cost of this, in terms of field ops, it costs one operation, right? But the bit cost of this is order n, right? Because you have to take n bits and n bits and add them, right? And then take care of any carries, right? So you've got to do this like for n positions. 
So, so this is what this is about. But for our discussion, let's just stick to uh, field operations. I mean, it doesn't really matter, frankly, uh, what you use for a discussion. The point is that it's polynomial time, okay? Okay, and of course, uh, do keep in mind, of course, that this is uh, what we call a homogeneous system of equations, okay? What that means is that you'll notice how there are no constants floating around, right? So in every equation, every term, there's a variable, right? The, the red ones are the variables, the, the bits of s. And so you see that there's no term that doesn't contain a variable, okay? So in a homogeneous system, there's always a trivial solution, right? The trivial solution is just set all the bits of the variables to zero, right? Set s basically to the zero string. Then you trivially satisfy everything, right? doesn't matter what the y's are. If you set every s uh, bit to zero, then of course the system is satisfied. And, you know, that's not the solution, of course, we were looking for, right, in general, okay? So let me write a note here. S equals to zero n is always a solution. A solution. And this is because the, the system is homogeneous. Okay, which is just a fancy way of saying there are no constants showing up in any of the equations. Okay. Um, Okay, and so that's the first note. The second note is that um, by our promise, though, we know. So what do we know? We know either s equals 0 to the n is the only solution, right? This is the that very funny case where the function f is actually 1 to 1. It's injective. Or uh, there's a unique choice. Um, there exists a unique uh, non-zero S. Okay. So do keep this in mind, right? So really, typically, you know, for most most instances, in some sense, you're interested in this non-zero solution, right? When when f is really two to one. Okay. So let me say something a little bit about probability of failure. Probability of failure, because the the quantum part, you know, we just it's a sampling procedure, right? It there's you can't really talk about uh, Okay, it always succeeds in the sense that the computation is not noisy. It will always produce some string from the set capital Y. Um, but the question is, you know, can the classical post-processing part fail? Okay. And so there is a catch here, right? And the catch is that if you want to be able to solve the system, right, of linear equations uh, in a unique fashion to get a unique solution, basically, um, the system has to be full rank, essentially full rank, like all these equations, right? All these, um, well, the, the coefficients, these y's, y1, y2, y3, uh, and so on up to yn, those all have to be uh, linearly, sorry, there should be three dots here. Those should all be linearly independent, okay? Because otherwise, you know, you're, you're duplicating equations, right? And you, you gain no new information. Okay, so um, in uh, Gaussian elimination, right? So when we run this algorithm, Um, to obtain the unique non-zero solution S, and this is of course assuming it exists, okay? So uh, we need the uh, Yi to be linearly independent and of course, you have to be a bit careful here. The yi are, are bit strings, right? So we're talking about an independent over f2. Okay, so with respect to the rules of f2, basically, you cannot, um, a linear combination of any of them cannot give uh, another one in the set, basically, right? They can't be written as linear combinations of one another uh, under uh, the addition um, rules of f2. Okay. Okay, so, but the thing is that. So, um, okay, if we're not careful, right, it could be that the y's we got through our sampling procedure are not linearly independent. But of course, uh, the key point here is that, remember we stressed that when we sample from the set y, right, where these little yi's are coming from, we're not sampling according to some funny distribution, we're really taking a uniform sample over the set, right? So um, in this sense, you would expect with very high probability the strings you get to be uh, linearly independent, okay? And we won't prove this, 
but uh, since we sample from uh, y uh, uniformly at random, okay, so the key point, of course, is the uniform part. Um, so it can be shown, but we won't do it here. Shown uh, y1 through yn minus 1 are uh, linearly independent. Uh, with probability, say, at least a quarter. Okay, so some constant probability. Okay, so and that, that's, of course, good enough. Um, so why is it good enough? Of course, um, you could boost this now. Um, so, so as soon as you get a constant probability of success, right? So basically, imagine one one of the algorithm is, you know, you, you run the quantum component n minus one times to pick up uh, n minus one strings y. And then you look at your system and you check, okay, if, if the strings y are all linearly independent, right, this is something you can check in polynomial time, then um, you know that you can run Gaussian elimination to get your solution and you'll be finished. Um, however, and that's gonna happen probably at least a quarter. However, if um, it turns out the your set of strings y1 through yn minus one is not linearly independent, then you're in trouble. Um, so you're gonna have to repeat the whole quantum sampling part again, right? And now the probability that you succeed each time is at least a quarter, right? So you can figure out, I'll, I'll leave this as an exercise, but you can figure out that if you repeat this whole experiment like k times, what is the probability that you never succeed in k trials, right? And you know, um, the short and the long of it is that, of course, that failure probably needs to go down exponentially, right? So this thing will succeed with very high probability very quickly. Okay. So that's Simon's algorithm. Okay, remember what it did for us is that um, I was given a, a function f that maps n bits to n bits, and I was promised that either um, it's an injective function or it's two to one in the sense that um, two inputs go to the same output if and only if the two inputs are the same up to this magic mask s, okay? And so Simon's algorithm allowed us to find this mask s um, using order n uh, queries basically to the oracle. By the way, notice how the, the classical post-processing, of course, doesn't need to make any further queries to the Oracle. Okay, good. Now, um, that problem seems really silly, right? Like, who cares about finding a hidden mask a priori, right? So, but the nice thing is that, um, as we mentioned earlier, this did have an important role to play um, as far as... Um, the development of Shor's factoring algorithm is okay. It was what um, inspired Shor to, to think about solving factoring using uh, this type of approach. Okay. But more recently, you know, there have been research works that show that, in fact, even Simon's algorithm as is can be used to do things like solve certain cryptographic uh, or break certain classical cryptographic uh, systems. Okay. And so now this is what I want to take a little bit of time to tell you about because, um, you know, Simon's algorithm is quote unquote older. Right, it's not a certainly not a, a newer algorithm. Right, it's uh, came from the kind of the early days, quote unquote, of quantum computing. But uh, it's nice to kind of complement that with something more modern. Right, to see um, over time, you know, how new uses for old things are discovered. Right. Okay. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to show uh, over here that uh, Simon's algorithm can be used. to break uh, a cryptographic primitive, and I'll define which one it is in a second, cryptographic primitive. And assuming, okay, and this is a non-trivial assumption, we, we will revisit this at the end, assuming a certain query model. Okay, so a lot of times, um, if you're talking about some some protocol, for example, if you allow, you know, if you give the quantum algorithm certain types of access to the data, like for example, uh, superposition queries um, to an oracle, let's say, um, then it turns out that you know a quantum algorithm makes the task easy. Okay, you can you can break the system, for example, and that's exactly what we're going to see today. Okay, so um, the exposition I'm going to give here is based on. Uh, let me make sure I do the author's justice. Um, that does not mean I can pronounce all names properly. 
uh, Santoli and Schaffner. Okay, and this is from uh, 2017. Okay, but these are not the only works, basically. Um, so if you look in the course notes, I have two other references that you can uh, look at. I'll just write the initials here in the interest of time. Okay, so if you're interested in this topic and you want to learn more, you know, there are some other references that do similar things, basically. Okay. Okay. So what are we going to break, right? That's the question, right? And so what we're going to break is something called the Feistel Network. And again, I do not claim I know how to pronounce that word Feistel properly, but that is what I'm sticking with for this lecture. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is, um, so in cryptography, a lot of times you want to do something um, that is not quite possible, right? So for example, um, so, so there's certain primitives, for example, you want to do maybe like bit commitment, for example, or key exchange. Um, and the particular primitive we're interested in this case is a random permutation. Okay, so, um, so you ask, you know, um, maybe it's impossible to do, um, you know, task X, right? So you ask, okay, well, what kind of minimal assumptions can I add to the computational model that make it possible for me to achieve, say, a random permutation or bit commitment or something like this, okay? So for example, what um, assumptions allow us to perform a random permutation. Okay, and presumably the idea here is that, you know, you don't want, okay, in your computer, for example, your computer pretends to be able to do random things, right? Like you can go in Java and ask for random numbers, but of course they're not genuinely random, right? They're pseudo-random. So um, what do you need to do a, a genuinely random permutation? Okay. Okay, so um, what does this mean basically? This just basically means that you know if you're given given an input x, we want to oops, what in the world is that? We want to output pi of x for uh, pi a random permutation. On end bits. Okay, so this is what I mean by perform. I mean, you give me a string and I, I mash up the strings right into some new ordering, basically, okay, at random. Okay, so, um, so let's make the assumption that we can't quite do a random permutation, but we can do something slightly weaker, which is a random function. Okay. So we can perform random functions. Okay, so functions, of course, include permutations, but um, I'm sampling over the full set of functions, right. Um, and let me tell you the particular space, of course. So this is all functions from n bits to n bits. Okay, so some of which of course include permutations, but generally speaking, when I pick a, a function at random, you know, it's gonna be some weird thing, right? It's gonna have nothing to do with the permutation a priori. Okay, so um, you might expect that if I can at least perform a random function, I should be able to simulate uh, a random permutation, at least in a good enough way. And indeed, you know, this is what a Faisal, so can um, we uh, bootstrap this to simulate a random uh, permutation, a random pi, right? So the answer is that classically, oops, classically the answer is yes. Okay, and this is um, this so-called Feistel networks, which I'll define next. Okay, and so now I have to be a little bit careful by what I mean, yes, right? I mean, so, uh, you know, I'm certainly not an expert in, in cryptography and in this area, but, um, you know, roughly speaking, the idea here is that it's not, of course, um, going to implement a genuine random permutation, but rather what it will do is uh, something that looks indistinguishable, computationally indistinguishable. Um, well, is it... That's a good question. 
Okay, yeah. So um, it's computationally distinguishable, right? So there, there are notions of say, uh, are are two objects distinguishable in polynomial time, or are they just indistinguishable? Period. No matter how much time you take. So in this case, um, you know what we'll end up implementing. You know, to any polynomial time computation, it looks as good as a random permutation. Okay, and of course, in many ways, that that seems like that should be good enough, right? Okay, so let me define a Fison network. So in particular, I'm going to focus on three round Fistel networks. Okay, because that'll suffice for our discussion. Okay. Um, okay, so what do these do? No, let's not do that. I suppose I should zoom back in. Yeah, okay. So what do three round Fistel networks do? Um, okay, so what does it do? Well, let me write it in pieces. So the input is what? The input is going to be um, a pair of strings. Okay, so um, L comma R, right? And this is going to be um, each of them's n bits. Okay. And there are three rounds, basically. So each round will produce a, a new pair of strings, basically. So um, maybe I should write this here. Each round um, I produces uh, a new string or pair of strings, li, ri, okay, um, in the same space. Okay, so we're not changing our workspace. And we define it recursively. So define recursively for um, i as in it's three rounds. So uh, there are three i's, one, two, three. And so the way it works is that the new li, like in the next round, basically, is equal to the previous um, ri minus one. And we'll draw a picture in a second. And the new ri is the previous li minus one. But we also um, add in one of our random functions onto ri minus one, okay? So here, uh, let me be clear, this guy here, this is taking me from um, n bits to n bits. And these are, remember I assumed that I can do random functions, not, not necessarily permutations, but just more broadly random functions, okay? Okay, so um, first let me draw uh, the picture of what this network actually looks like, right? So uh, let's think of it like as follows. So I've got two inputs, right? I've got L and R, and actually I'm gonna call the strings X and Y to be consistent with the notes later. So maybe I'll just put this in brackets, right? So, but you have two strings, right? And each of them is N bits, uh, likewise on this side, right? And so these come into the picture, right? And now what happens is that um, you know, in round one, right, what is the value of the new left bit? Well, it's just the previous right bit, basically, right? It's uh, R0 in that case, right? So what happens is that we just copy that, uh, well, I shouldn't say bit, it's a string. We copy that string over. And what is R1? What is the new value down here? Well, it's the old L0, right? It's, it's what came in this way, right? So I'm going to move that over, right? But there's also something else, right? It's L0 plus my first random function f1 applied to my previous r string. So in this case, it would be kind of the input right string. Okay, so we're going to take both these guys and we're going to plug them into f of 1. And remember, f of 1 is my random function. Okay, so this is my point. Um, round 1, yeah, so... Um, so when you look at these definitions, like L1 and R1, it's the strings basically at this point, okay? And now we repeat, right? So that's round one, and then uh, we could do this again, right? Uh, so again, the new left bit, was we just cross over, right? And we just copy that bit over. And here, what we do is we do the next random function, F2. And then, but it depends on, on two inputs, right? Not just one. So maybe I could be a little bit more precise. Let me just... Um, Okay, so it takes in two inputs, gives you one output. Okay, and so this is going to be uh, round two. 
for the end of round two. And last but not least, we repeat this one last time. So this is over here. This is uh, our third random function, f3. And we put in two input bits here. And there we go, round three. Okay, so, and of course, uh, let me just be clear here. Again, this is, you know, n bits. This is n bits. Okay, so this is how, the way the function works, right? It's trying to simulate uh, a random permutation of these strings, right? And so what it does is it kind of keeps swapping them back and forth. And every time, uh, in some sense, I mean, it's not exactly that. And every time uh, we go through a round, it picks a random function and sticks um, x and y into it. And um, let me be very clear, the random functions, where did I define them? These should be f2n, right, to n. I feel there's a I feel like there is a typo there. We probably want Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm uh, being just a bit uh, unscrupulous here. So, um, sorry. Um, fi is indeed from n bits to n bits. Yeah. So, but it needs to take in r first, right? So this should come in here, and then we need to xor the answer on the l bits. Yeah. So, so I skipped the step in my head basically. Let's move this back. Let's correct all of these. Okay. So basically, first this comes in, right? And we do f1. Right, and then the answer of that, we uh, do an bitwise XOR, right? And now that makes sense. Okay, good. And then F2, uh, same deal. Um, this thing. Okay. And last but not least, this goes over. This thing comes down here. Let's do another box for F3. Okay. There we go. So now it makes sense, right? So indeed, now sanity check, right? So again, every time you do something, um, set something up, you should just make sure that the input and output spaces match, right? So so that's why I figured something was fishy here, uh, because I had two wires coming into this thing, but uh, we said that this is only an n bit um, a function that goes from n bits to n bits, right? And indeed, now it makes sense. Now it takes an n bit string, outputs an n bit string, then we take bitwise XOR of two n bit strings, and, and now it's fully well defined. And indeed, that matches exactly what we see here. Okay, so um, so here's the the whole claim, right? I mean, I won't prove this, but classically the claim is that um, if you're given a black box, just like we've been doing so far, like a query oracle, right? Uh, if you're given a black box uh, UF, uh, sorry, maybe I'll just call it U in this case. Okay, and what does it do? I mean, just like uh, this network over here, it it's gonna take in uh, two n bits. Right, it's going to output two n bits, so some even number of bits. And this black box, we're promised that it performs either a genuinely random permutation, or a Faisal network, a three-round Faisal network. And we don't know which one, of course, it is. We're just promised one of the two is the case. Okay. So this is just like the promises for the previous um, black box problems we had in, in that regard. And the claim is that classically speaking, um, you cannot in polynomial time distinguish uh, the two cases, right? I mean, so it's a, so this is the sense in which I meant uh, slightly earlier that um, this thing indeed simulates a, a random permutation, assuming you're able to randomly choose uh, these n bit functions, okay, genuinely random, okay? So, so here's the other claim, the next claim. So Simon's algorithm can distinguish the two. Okay, so whether you have a, if you give me a black box U and you don't tell me uh, whether it's random permutation or Faisal network, Simon's algorithm can actually do that distinguishing for you, even though classically this is impossible in polynomial time. What's the, I don't want to say the catch, but what is the assumption, right? I mean, especially when you talk about something like 
uh, crypto black box algorithms, I mean, you have to be very clear about what all the assumptions are, right, that go into the result. So assuming, right, assuming, um, yes, uh, we can query you in superposition. Right? So this is what we said earlier, basically. Okay, so um, this is a non-trivial assumption. Okay, so for example, if you had a, think about it this way, if you had your classical uh, database, like your, your, your hard drive, right? I mean, what makes you believe that you can query that, you know, as is uh, in superposition if you had some sort of quantum device sitting on the side, right? I mean, that's not entirely obvious, right? So it is a, a non-trivial assumption whenever we say, um, and this is kind of true of uh, many results in, in things like quantum machine learning or um, quantum big data, if you will, where um, you have to be looking to just be clear about what are the assumptions that go into these algorithms, right? Like um, a lot of them assume, for example, that you can um, query um, large databases in superposition, for example, right? And, and just like you can here. Okay, so I'm not saying it's good or bad. All I'm saying is that, uh, you know, you have to be careful how you define the model and how you interpret the results. Yeah. Okay, now, um, how to break. So let's do it, right? Okay, so let me be slightly more precise now. I'll try and keep this uh, network on the side because we will need it. So let you be this black box. Uh, compute either uh, a 2n bit uh, permutation or uh, a three round Feistel network um, with random functions. And of course, we don't know what these random functions are. F1, F2, and F3. Okay, so assume that one of these two uh, is the case. Okay, and the goal is um, to distinguish between these two cases, right? Okay, is you a random permutation or a Faisal network? So we want to apply a Simon's algorithm, right? So to use Simon's algorithm, What do we want? We want to define a function. We want to define some function f, which satisfies you know the, the promise from Simon's problem, right? Which is f of x equals f of y. So I should say there exists an s such that f of x equals f of y, uh, if and only if x equals to y plus s. Okay, that was the Simon's problem, right? So we had to solve for s. So we somehow want to take um, you know, the structure of uh, this Feistel uh, network and kind of bootstrap it in a way that I can embed it into some function f having this property whenever it is a Feistel network. Okay. And of course, um, if, if the box u is really genuinely random, it has no structure at all, right? So I've, any, any function I define intuitively, you know, it's not going to have any sort of nice structure like this, right? That's kind of the intuition we're going for. So what we're going to do is I'm going to first look at, maybe I'll try and copy this thing down again, just so I can always keep it around. Is it working or not? Okay, let's try that again. It's not going to work. All right, oh, that's fine. Um, Okay, so in this network, you see that, um, you know, they're, they're the left bits, right? And the, and the right bits, and they kind of swap back and forth, right? Um, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna just focus on this part of the output here, on these first n bits, okay? So I'm gonna imagine a restricted function, right? 
which takes in X and Y and it runs the network. And then it kind of flushes down these bits into the toilet and just looks in out, uh, looks at what's coming out this side. Okay. So let me just define that. So, um, define over here V. So it taken the whole network took in two n bits, right? But now I'm only looking at the first um, n bits to be uh, the output from um, the first n bits of, I mean, of course, I don't know if you use this network or random permutation, but it's the first n bits of whatever u outputs, right? So in if it were a FISAL network, we're looking at these n bits, okay? So this is just a restricted function, basically. Okay, so now um, let's do an observation. Okay, so if u is indeed a FISAL network, then you know I can give a nice expression for this. Okay, so again, um, keep in mind that I'm, I've kind of relabeled this thing as, you know, X and Y is the inputs, right? So these are the two inputs. So that's why over here you see uh, V of X, Y, right? And, you know, this is just going to be uh, Y plus F2 of X plus F1 of Y. Okay, so, uh, this is technically now an exercise to verify this, but, you know, we can quickly kind of eyeball it, right? So this is kind of the, the structure you see, right? Where there's, if you look at this uh, thing over here, right? You know, if I look at, this is the bit, these are the bits I'm looking at, right? As the output. So where did they come from? Well, you know, I, if I backtrack here this way, right? You see, I have a, a direct sum uh, or sorry, an XOR with something that came out of the box F2 uh, and some other string. And that's, that's kind of what you see here. Here's Y, right? That, that must be here. Right, um, and indeed, you know, if we trace this back further enough, right, where does y come from? Well, you know, this is just y, right? There it is. Okay, and uh, it plus the sum of whatever's coming out of f two, right? And so, so that's what this is. So, what went into f two? Well, what went into f two is, you know, again the XOR of what came out of f one. So, so that's this thing, plus uh, this left side x two, right? So that's what came into f two. So I'll let you kind of repeat that argument to yourself until you're comfortable with it. Um, but you can believe me that, you know, when I define this restricted function that just has this output on the first n bits um, of a Feistel network, then, you know, the function turns out to have this very specific form, of course. Um, you might be wondering where the F3 went, right? So where did F3 go, the third random function? Well, F3 is over here, right? But I don't care about these n bits, I care about these bits, right? And you'll notice how this line of bits never goes through F3. Right, so that's why F3 doesn't actually show up in this expression right now. Okay, F3 only affects the last n bits of the output, which we are not caring about. Okay, so now I can define my function F, right? Remember I wanted to define a function F um, that had this type of Simon-like property. Okay, we won't get there exactly, um, but we'll get close, close enough. So defining F, uh, and then of course using V. Okay. So what do we do? First, I want you to fix two um, arbitrary strings. So they're arbitrary fix, you know exactly what they are. Um, so fix arbitrary alpha and beta, which are n bit strings. Okay. And then what we're gonna do is I'm going to write down my function a comma b. Okay, so this is the function f uh, that I was talking about. And um, the function itself is, you know, slightly different in the sense that, um, you know, the input to this thing, you could really think of it as a, a two tuple. Okay, so let me um, clarify how the function is defined, then we'll be very clear about the input space to f, okay? So uh, what I want you to do is I want you to think of um, f, well, okay, let me do as I said I would, which is that I want you to think of a basically as a control bit. So you'll notice how I said bit, not bits. So it's just a single bit actually. And I want you to think of B as some argument. Okay. And so again, um, whenever you see definition, you got to do your sanity check, right? So what is the space acting on? 
f acting on. So what I've told you right now is that it takes in uh, a single bit, right? And then it takes in some longer argument and, you know, let's just say that's n, n bits, right? So the input now, you know, you can think of that if you like as one big um, string of length n plus one, of course. But I, I'm separating it in, in how it's written here because I really want to emphasize that this is interpreted differently than these guys, okay? It's going to be used for a different purpose. Okay, and how is this thing defined? Well, if a is a control bit, I'm going to have some sort of case switching happening here. So if a equals to zero versus if a equals to one. Okay, so that's why I'm putting a aside. And how do we do this? Well, I'm going to use the function v, right? I define this function v. So um, maybe what I'll do is I will do these guys. Can we make them blue? Yeah, okay, let's make these blue so you can kind of see where they stand out a little bit more. So I'm going to apply the function v, okay, on uh, alpha, alpha. Okay, so v takes two arguments, right? So I've given you the second argument. And then after v, I'm going to add on this alpha. And the only difference between the first and the second line uh, will be that here I use beta if the control bit is 1. If the control bit is 0, then I would use alpha. And then what goes over here is the only um, part I haven't used yet, the only parameter, which is b, right? I haven't used that yet. So, so this is the definition of f, the function f. Okay, so stare at it for a second. It's probably not clear at all why this should uh, be a useful definition of f, why it should satisfy anything like Simon's um, promise, let's say. So to prove that, or to understand that, we first have to show a fact, right? Um, So let me make a claim. Um, so f almost, quote unquote, satisfies um, Simon's promise, or the promise of Simon's problem, if you will. Okay, oh, sorry. And of course, this is uh, not in general, right? This is uh, when u is a Feistel network. Right, so if you look at this thing, right, um, I could always, uh, so this, you know, this V is defined independent of whether or not the underlying black box U was a random permutation or a Feistel network, right? This, this I have no idea, a priori, but I could always, you know, it's, it's some box that takes in two inputs, right? And either does a random permutation or it does a Feistel network. If, so, I mean, so the definition of F, of course, is independent of what kind of um, actual implementation of U you have. So it just plugs into inputs and does like this bitwise XOR, okay? And, but we know that, you know, so if it's a random permutation, of course, this thing is in general not gonna have any structure, but if V, sorry, if U is a Feistel network, then uh, this V function, remember we observed has this very nice for clean form, right? And so uh, that means that, um, you know, when V, sorry, when uh, U is a Feistel network, you know, I can expand this out and come up with a cleaner, um, description in terms of, you know, the random functions and the structure of that Feistel network. So let's do that next. Okay. So let's do, so this is actually the next exercise. So I won't like prove it fully, but we'll kind of sketch again why this is true. So if um, U is a Feistel network, F of A comma B then can be simplified to f2 b plus um, f1 of alpha uh, if a is zero if a is one okay and this is going to be f2 of b f1 of beta okay So why is this true? Well, I mean, this this is just basically straightforwardly. Um, so let me just really stress here that this definition is independent of um, the implementation of U, right? Of U. So um, all we've done here is, you know, we've taken this definition for F and I'm assuming that U is a Feistel network. So that means that I could use uh, this equation here. 
right? So to get this, and maybe I'll call this one here double star, plug star into star star, right? Okay, and by kind of doing this, you'll get a sense of, uh, you know, why um, one might define this thing this way, right? So if you had a Feistel network, right, when I look at this thing, for example, and I look at V of B alpha, um, it's going to basically, what does it do? Well, look at the second parameter here, right? So you'll notice how um, the second parameter is alpha, right? Here's the second parameter. And the second parameter is Y up here. And so what it does is it adds on Y, right? It XORs on Y. So it's F2 of some stuff over here, but then it XORs on Y, right? So in our case, Y is alpha, so it's going to XOR on alpha. But you'll see that out here, I undo that alpha, right? That uh, So I have V of all this, and then, and then the result of that is XORed with alpha again, right? So that means that if I have a Feistel network, you know, I get this extra copy of alpha, and these two will cancel each other out. And that's precisely why you don't see the alpha out here, right? When A equals zero. That disappears, and the only thing you have left is whatever you know this F2 term was, right? Here's your F2 term. Okay, so this is because you had a Feistel network, right? It had this funny um, additive structure, right? And of course, if you have a random permutation, then um, you know V is not going to, in general, look anything like this, right? Okay, good. So basically, whenever U is a Feistel network, I can simplify. The description of my function f that I've defined to look like this. Okay, so here's now the claim, yet another claim I should say. So I claim that one direction of Simon's promise holds. So there exists an S, okay so this is of course assuming we're talking about a Feistel network, there exists an S such that um, um, if I take two strings, um, x and y, um, and they're related by this choice of s that I'm going to define, then my function f of x will equal to f of y. Okay, so um, remember for, for Simon's problem, um, this was an if and only if, right? We said that you know f of x equals to f of y, if and only if this was true, assuming s was non-zero, of course, right? Um, so here we're only going to get really one direction in general that, you know, there is some choice. If you have a Feistel network, there is a choice of S, right? So that um, if you define any pair of inputs in this way, then you, you'll get equality coming out. Okay. Okay, so what is the choice of S? So set S to be equal to... Um, now... Technically speaking, you know, I'm, I'm being a little bit, um, I hesitate to word, use the word sloppy, but I guess it's sloppy, right? I mean, F technically the way I've defined it is, you know, it takes in two inputs, right? A bit and then n more bits. But of course here I'm just thinking of it as just one big uh, n plus one bit string, right? So, I mean, just to be clear, you know, this is an n plus one bit string. Uh, and here, remember we had uh, one bit and n bits, right? So I'm, I'm just kind of concatenating everything together. That's what's happening. So when I define S, I'm going to go back to thinking of it as one bit concatenated separately, or sorry, in a tuple with um, an additional n bits, okay? So I'm going to define S in this way, one comma, right? So the first bit, the control bit basically, and F1 of alpha uh, plus F1 of beta. Okay, so that's how I'm defining S, okay? So now notice that for any input, zero comma B okay um, and the case of one comma B is analogous so I'm not gonna do it again they're pretty much the same what do we have well let's see so I I want to see what's gonna happen if I take um, my my input right my input is zero comma B right and I add on this mask, right? And the claim is that I should get the same answer as just zero comma B, right? That's what I'm, I said that there exists a choice of S and I'm claiming this is the choice of S right here. So that if I define, um, you know, if I think about Y plus S basically, um, so like this thing plus this, that should give me the same value as just, uh, well, well, 
uh, okay, I guess it gives you something even a bit stronger, right? So when we go through this, what we're going to see is that, um, so let's just do this, right? So zero comma B, right? And then I'm going to get uh, plus S, right? Which is one comma F1 of um, alpha plus F1 of beta. Okay. Okay, so what's going to happen here is that you're going to... Um, Right, so let's add these now. Okay, so of course we're going to, um, it's a bitwise XOR, right? So let's keep this in mind. This is a bitwise XOR, so I can focus on each of the components separately. So zero plus one is just gonna give me one, right? Let me be consistent with my notes. Yeah, so it's just gonna be one comma. And then I'm gonna add uh, the second components, right? The second components are gonna be uh, B direct sum of F1 of alpha plus F1 of beta. Okay. Okay, and now if you just stare at this for a second, right? Uh, what is this thing? Right, so let's, um, so let me just write the answer first and then we'll just check it, right? So this is really just F2 of B plus F1 of alpha. Oops, this is alpha. Okay, so why is that true? Uh, I mean, just look at this thing, right? Here's F, right? And when I plug in a control bit one, that means I'm in this branch. And what does it do? It takes in the second part. And here's my second part, right? So it plugs that in to F. So here, um, you know, B becomes this thing, B plus F1 of alpha plus F1 of beta. But then I have two copies of F1 of beta, right? So those are gonna cancel each other out. And I'll just be left with B plus F1 of alpha. Okay. Okay, and so what is this? Well, then I claim that really this is nothing other than f of zero b, right? Why? I mean, just have a look at this. Where do, where do we see this expression? Well, this is exactly this expression here, right? So this is precisely the case where I, for my function f, I plugged in control bit zero, so that's my control bit zero, and I put in you know b over here, right? So so that's literally that. So what we see is that indeed. You know, um, if I take an input 0b and I XOR on s, I get the same answer, okay? Okay, so basically the, the claim, uh, the conclusion here is that, um, you know, let me write this again uh, slightly more formally, that, you know, there's some choice of s on n plus one bits such that for all inputs um, a comma b, f of a b is equal to f of a comma b direct sum s. Okay, so I have this very strong property, um, and so this is in some sense the the reverse implication of um, well in the notes it's equation five, but it's basically. Yeah, it should be the Simons uh, thing, right? So we said we wanted something along the lines of Simons property, right? Here it is, right? So this is if and only if it's two directions. So this is the, the reverse direction, basically, right? That uh, if you have this type of relationship holding, then uh, the function evaluates to the same value on both inputs, right? So that direction holds. The reverse direction actually in general is not going to be true. And I'll leave that to you as an exercise. So, so, um, this is, uh, actually, let me give a name to that equation. Do, 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 do. This one, okay. Let's call this triple star. So this is the defining uh, promise of Simon's problems. Simon's problem, I guess. And so this is um, the reverse direction, right? of triple star, right? The forward direction of triple star um, does not hold in general. Okay. Now it turns out that, you know, for this algorithm that we're doing to break this FISO network, we don't actually need the other direction, okay? But you know that's a nice exercise for you to work on. It's basically um, on page near the bottom of page five in the notes.
Okay. So, um, so the idea now is basically something we've said over and over again, which is that you know if u really is a random permutation, right? Then you know I've defined this function f, and, and you know it's defined very carefully around what would have happened if I really did have a Fisel network. If u was really a random permutation, you know it's going to be unlikely that such an s will exist that satisfies this equation. Okay, and we won't prove that here, but um, you know that can be shown. Okay. Um, however, when you do have a, a Faisal network, you know this kind of structure will show up, and that's something that Simon's algorithm will detect. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the idea is that. Um, so what's now the idea, right? Um, if U is a random permutation. So let me call this star four now. It's uh, unlikely for a uh, star for it to hold. Okay. So um, therefore, what we do is uh, run a Simon's algorithm on um, on U, right? So I've been given the black box U, and what I'm going to do is um, try to compute this mask s, right? If it's uh, if it's a Feistel network, I should be able to do it, right? Um, so if we succeed, we conclude uh, we have a Feistel network. Okay, and otherwise, um, we conclude that we have a, a random permutation. Okay, so that's at least at a high level what we're going to do. Um, two comments. I mean, so I will actually, to close the lecture, we will right now write down like the, the full algorithm itself. Um, we won't fully analyze it. We'll leave that as an exercise. Um, but let me do, um, let me mention one thing, right? Which is that as an exercise, um, the next exercise in the notes, basically, I don't have black box access to F, right? So remember that what I'm doing is that, you know, I do, I define this function f over here, right? If we scroll up a little bit more, uh, we define this funny function f here, right? And that function f is not what I have, um, at least not directly black box access to. What I have black box access to is u, right? And so um, how do we define f? Well, um, we took u, right? u implements, well, okay, implements uh, some function that outputs two n bits. We restricted the output of that to just the first n bits to define v, and then we, um, bootstrapped v to define f, okay? So um, a nice little exercise is that uh, to show that indeed, if you have black box access to u, right, then you could simulate queries to this function f that we've defined, okay? So um, again, we won't do this here, but given black box access to u, um, show how to simulate black box access to f, right? Which is really the function we cared about. That's the function that has this hidden mask whenever we have a Faisal network, okay? Okay, so here, um, let me just briefly write down, um, you know, the, the algorithm of this paper, basically. Um, see also um, this other reference we mentioned at the start. Uh, again, check the notes for all the references. Um, and what it does is that it returns um, either Feistel or random. Okay, and that's its guess, basically. And it works like this. Okay, so here's step one. So first we initialize an empty set S. Okay, and the, the point of S is gonna be, it's going to store all the samples that we get out of Simon's algorithm, right? Because in Simon's algorithm, remember, basically the, the quantum component is just going to um, output, um, outputs, uh, sorry, uh, stores the samples 
Remember we said we are gonna sample from this set capital Y in Simon's algorithm, so samples, stores the samples YI uh, from Simon's um, quantum subroutine, basically, the sampling part. Okay. Okay, now, um, now it's an empty set, and now, of course, we're gonna actually do um, the, the quantum subroutine, so repeat. And remember the goal is you want to go until you find a linearly independent set, right? So repeat until S uh, contains an uh, linearly independent strings or vectors over F2, Y0, 1 to the N plus 1. Okay, so, um, so here's a loop, right? So if my set is large enough, Turns out that I can just return Feistel. Okay, again, I'll leave the analysis uh, aside. Um, otherwise, right, if I still, if my set's not too large and I still I have not found n linearly independent strings, then you want to run Simon's algorithm on the black box you designed for f in this last exercise. And this will sample um, some string y. Oops. And then you want to add uh, y to s. Okay, so remember we, we said we set up this set s, right? So um, you, you pick up your next sample and you repeat this over and over again. Okay, and hopefully you're going to eventually hit n in linearly independent strings. Okay. And now, now that you have a linearly independent system, now you can solve for s, right? Just like we did before. So solve uh, the system of equations. And so remember, this is like yi uh, dot s equals zero to obtain an s zero one to the n plus one. Okay, so, so that's uh, exactly the type of thing we did in Simon's algorithm. So once you have a linearly independent system, you just solve it. But of course now, um, you do have to check that indeed this is a mask, right? Because uh, at least intuitively, uh, if you had a random permutation, you know, it's still plausible that you're gonna pick up, you know, you run Simon's algorithm, right? You do a measurement, it's gonna do some funny sampling procedure and it's quite possible you'll still get, you know, a set of linearly independent strings, which will give you some string uh, S, right? But it's not really a mask in the, in the sense of the promise for Simon's problem, right? It's just kind of some string that happened to come out of the sampling process if you were to be a genuinely random permutation, okay? It's only um, when we had a Faisal network that, you know, that S will actually mean something, okay? It'll correspond to Simon's promise. So what we need to do is we want to check, indeed, that um, S is correct, okay? That it's really a mask. So what you do, the most uh, naive thing to do is just this, right? Pick uh, inputs, uh, pick a random input, basically. Again, control bit, tensor the rest. Uh, uniformly at random, and then check um, that um, f of a b. Okay, so I make a query, right? Uh, so we'll do a query with a b is equal to um, f of um, a b, right? But now with the mask, right? Because if it is a mask, then these two should be the same. Okay. So if uh, this holds, then we guess that, aha, okay, we found a mask. So this must be a Faisal network. It must have the underlying structure we were looking for. And otherwise, uh, we just output random. It's a random permutation. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's the whole algorithm. Okay, again, I'm not going to go uh, further into the details of its analysis. Um, but I, I'm very happy to refer you to, uh, you know, these papers that we looked at. Uh, do have a look at the notes. There are three references listed in the back if you want to read more details. Okay. So, you know, just to briefly recap, you know, this is a lecture on uh, Simon's problem, which is kind of the next step after Deutsch's algorithm or the Deutsch-Jose algorithm, uh, where here, again, you're solving what seems to be a relatively uh, obscure problem, let's say, 
but it actually gives you an exponential separation between um, the number of queries you need quantumly versus uh, what a classical randomized algorithm would, would require. And we didn't prove that, but you can prove it. Um, and then we showed an application um, in cryptography to breaking these so-called Feistel networks, right? And here the idea was that you wanted to simulate a random permutation as a basic cryptographic primitive. And you say, I assume that I can do something a bit weaker. Um, I can do uh, a random function from n bits to n bits. And then um, classically, it turns out you can bootstrap this using a Feistel network to simulate a random permutation. But this construction uh, fails quantumly, meaning that in a quantum world where I could access a black box um, implementing either uh, a Feistel network or a genuinely random permutation, uh, a quantum algorithm, which is able to make superposition queries to this black box, can distinguish which case we're in. Okay, and remember that this, it was a non-trivial assumption that you can make superposition queries to this black box, to this classical object, yeah? Okay, so that's it for this lecture. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Um, uh, the next assignment again is due this Friday. And otherwise, hope you guys have a great week and see you next week.